Okay, if somebody stops me with 10 minutes left, we can go over any problems that you have from the homework problems. All right, so we started on this the other day, which was Wednesday, um, starting to look at some coupling reactions of how to put more complicated alkyl groups on the ring using some different, um, using either a hack or a, what we'll talk about today, Suzuki coupling. And I want to kind of just start out by giving a little bit more, a little bit more of a concrete example. So let's say that I said, I gave you a problem that I wanted you to do that. Take benzene and basically make what's called beta methyl styrene out of it. But put this double bond, this three carbon with a double bond group on the benzene ring. The only way without using a coupling, and we could do this by Gilman or by, Gilman or by um, using a lithium cuprate reagent, the only way we have to do this right now is to take that benzene ring and first of all put a straight chained propyl group on it, except we can't add straight chained propyl groups to the benzene ring. All we can do is add the straight chained propyl group in the form of a phenyl ketone, then reduce that down to the propyl group using either like a Wolf-Kishner or Clemenson reduction. Then we would have to put a bromine onto the benzylic position. And then we could do an E2 reaction to take that benzyl bromide and convert it into a double bond. So that's one, two, three, four steps in order to put that alkene group on the benzene ring. Whereas if we talked about the idea of using the lithium cuprate, if I had, for instance, put my bromine on, let's see, put my bromine on the alkyl or on the alkyne group or on the alkene group treated that with lithium metal which would give me a, a negative charge with the lithium plus and then add copper iodide to that I would form my lithium cuprate reagent and then I could just say okay add that lithium cuprate reagent to bromobenzene and I would make that molecule in one, two, three steps. So by using a coupling reagent I could save a step. And I don't have to do all of the side chain reactions from before. And, and so the reality is that if you're going to do synthesis to make really complicated drug molecules, you really want to put pieces together as opposed to try and change one piece of the molecule without changing another. Because you might react this part of the molecule with KMNO4, but you've got to make sure the other part doesn't react as well, which gets you into protecting and all sorts of things. So in a lot of cases, what we do is we do these coupling reactions. So this lithium cuprate would be the example of a coupling reaction that we saw from before. I'm just now applying it to the benzene, to a benzene ring system. Okay, and 
So last time we talked about some more benzene reaction. We talked about Gatterman Coke, which allows you to add a benzaldehyde group directly onto the ring. But what we wanted, but there's a couple couplings that we'll talk about that I could do this, for instance, in one step if I needed to. So the first one is going to be what we call heck coupling. And there's also going to be some advantage, some environmentally friendly advantages to these reactions as well. So in heck coupling, if I want to react a benzene ring, I'm going to take like bromobenzene and I'm going to react that with any alkene directly. I need a transition metal catalyst. And most organic synthesis now um, that people do involves a lot of different transition metal catalysts, whether it's things like palladium or ruthenium. Um, that's what most people do. So in this case, we're going to take palladium and we're going to react that. Well, we're going to have actually palladium acetate and then what's called triphenylphosphine. Now, acetate, OAC, is our deprotonated acetic acid. There's two of those. If you remember back to mercury acetate when we were doing mercuration, demercuration, it was the same thing. Triphenylphosphine has three has three benzene rings attached to the phosphorus. And the key there is the triphenylphosphine, the phosphorus, is a decent base. So as, that, as the reaction occurs, that'll take any protons away that are produced. <coughs> so when you do this reaction in water as the solvent, you basically couple the benzene ring then with the double bond. So if there's a hydrogen over here, there's two hydrogens over here, That's this is the bond that I'm forming is this benzene ring double bond to the double bond single. Okay. So I can do this in one step if I use hat coupling. Advantages, there's no organic solvents. I can do this in water, which would be much more environmentally friendly. And that's a big, that's a big issue when you're trying to make molecules, particularly if you're trying to scale this up. That would be a, a huge issue. There's no solvents to dispose of. So heck coupling, we take a double bond, we react it with an alkyl halide or an aryl halide, and we end up adding double bonds. So if I wanted to, I could expand this reaction to I could expand this reaction to say, oh well let's just take how about I take something like this? take any bromide, and if I did this reaction, I would then replace the bromine with this group, so I could end up forming a conjugated diene by coupling this piece to this piece. So in, in heck coupling, I'm basically taking and I can add a double bond to the ring because this is going to be our primary focus is adding groups to the benzene ring. So you could take any any double bonded alkyl group you wanted and attach that to the ring or couple it to the ring using bromobenzene and the um, palladium catalyst. 
And the last thing I'll say on this is that when you're doing, and I don't do real synthesis. If it's like, if I can't buy it, I don't like to use it. Um, maybe a step. I'll do one step if it's easy. But I'm not a synthetic chemist. But those that are, when you're looking at making really, really big molecules, what you're doing is you're actually, there's maybe one set of, gr one group that's making this part and another group might be making that part. And if there's a third part, another group might be making that. And so these coupling reactions let each of the groups work on their parts and then we just bring them together and make the molecule that we need to make. So that means that if I wanted to ch have this R group be methyl or ethyl or isopropyl or put a benzene ring on it and then start substituting the benzene ring, I could do that and make a whole library of different compounds, which is how drug discovery still sort of works. That what you do is you make a whole list, you make a whole library of molecules with slightly different groups on it, and then you test each one out to see which one does what you want it to do. Either kill a cancer cell or inhibit something or something like that. So if you can couple two reactions together and you can do it environmentally friendly, that's a preferred method. And so the heck reaction is probably the more most modern reaction that we've talked about in terms of people doing it on a routine basis that are doing like real synthesis. And sadly, we don't do real synthesis in lab, right? Our four steps, after our four step lab, when you have to go to the bottle to supplement what you have, right? If that was graduate school, you'd have, you'd have younger graduate students bringing up A and making more B and making more C so that when you got to D, you'd have more material to work with. But that's, and most people are not working on a simple four or five steps, they're working on 10 or 15. So this is, that's the idea of including these reactions is simply that these are coupling reactions that let us put two pretty complicated molecules together in one snap. So that's heck coupling. Another reaction that, we're, that is a coupling reaction that's going to take us back to alkene reactions is Suzuki coupling. And in the Suzuki coupling, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an alkyl halide. Again, in this case, we'll take something like bromobenzene because I'm going to be still want to add things to the ring and I'm going to react this with a boronic ester so boronic ester has a B with two OR groups attached to it And so then this R group and this R group are going to couple together in Suzuki coupling. The catalysts are simply palladium metal and NaOH. And that means we can do this reaction in water, so it's also environmentally friendly. Now the boronic ester comes from taking this boronic ester where there's just a hydrogen and adding that to a double bond. So what is this molecule right here like? It's like H, it's like BH3 where if you go back and you remember when we added BH3 to a double bond, we added a hydrogen to one carbon and then the BH2 molecule to the other carbon and then H2, H2O2 came in and replaced the boron with an OH group. So the same thing's gonna happen here. 
when I react this H and this boronic ester part on the double bond, the H is going to add to one carbon of the double bond and the boron with the two OR groups is going to add to the other carbon. So let's see how much we remember about this reaction. Everybody have their little cards out? If anybody, if anybody needs a card, I've got extras. Um, okay, so again, how those work is there's a square, there's an A, B, C, and D along each edge of the square. Whatever you hold that's at the top, that's your answer. So you have to hold it, and then I take the phone, and I go like this, and it tallies up the results. It's a clickerless clicker system. Okay, so my question number one is, how does the H and the boron add? And your choices are 100% trans, 100% cis, or C, 50-50. So when we, add, when we added the H and the BH2 to the double bond, how did we end up adding? 100% cis, 100% trans, or 50-50. Hold on, we're going to have to do that again. <laughs> The reason we have to do that again is because I had the it oh it didn't overwrite everybody's from this morning, so there were like thirty six responses. There ain't thirty six people here. Okay. All right. So, and it doesn't actually tell me how you. It just tells me that it picked up the card. It doesn't tell me what you voted. The old one used to do that. The old software. Oh, good. We got an eight nine one. Eight trans, eight cis, and one fifty fifty. All right. I'll give you a minute to discuss, and then we'll revote. Are we ready to revote? We'll be in about thirty seconds. Might as well leave it out because we're going to use it for the next few minutes. Okay, in the end, we're now down to 18, 1 and 18, so 18, 100% cisses. Because the H and the, you have to hold it the other way, right? <laughs> <laughs> It might have read. It might have no, read. I was it, but... Okay. Um. 
So it's 100% cis. I heard square. Is it a triangle? Is it a square? The H and the boron both add it to the double bond at the same time. So it's a square intermediate, which means cis. Okay. And when I wrote it here, I didn't necessarily intend it to be cis, but it is. All right. So now I have another question then, because let's say that I gave you this methyl cyclohexene. And so I've got carbon A and I've got carbon B, so that I'm going to add my boronic ester. And the reason this is called an ester is because these are OR groups. If those were OHs, it would be a boronic acid. So when I add my boronic ester to this double bond, we've already decided that it's going to add 100% cis, the H and the BR. Or sorry, the H and the, the, H and the boron. So it's easy to get the boron confused with the BR. Um, but the H and the boron are going to add 100% cis. My next question is, where does the H go? Is the H going to add to carbon B A, carbon B, or is it going to add 50-50? Yep. Uh oh. So where's the where is H going to add to carbon A or carbon B or 50-50? And the other thing you'll notice with these cards is that they're set up so that they're kind of random. So you can't really look around and see if it's horizontal or vertical because that doesn't, for each card, it's a, different, it's a different layout. Good, 18 to one, correct answer? Yes. So H adds to carbon A. Sometimes it's 18 to one and it's the wrong answer. So the H is definitely going to add to carbon A. So for instance, if I was adding this, I would end up adding the, the um, H to carbon A, and then I would end up with the boron part added to carbon B. And so now if I wanted to add a benzene ring to this, I would take something like bromobenzene. I would go ahead and react this with palladium metal and uh, NaOH and water and now I would basically replace the entire boron group with what's attached to the bromine couple those two together and so my final product here would be the benzene ring adding to there So what Suzuki coupling gives you is a little bit more control over the stereochemistry because you're using this boronic acid, boronic ester to add to the double bond. So that's so Suzuki coupling I think is known a little bit more than is um, heck heck coupling. But they both use different molecules that we can go ahead and and make. Okay. I'll do one more here. If I started with an alkyne and I reacted that with the boronic ester, what would I end up with? What goes where? The H and the boron go where? Here and here? Here? Yeah. H. And then down here, H and R. So again, I'm going to add 
the hydrogen and the boron cis, and I'm going to add the anti Markovnikov. So then I could take this molecule and I could replace this boron group with a benzene ring simply by reacting it with bromobenzene. So the idea here is that when you're doing these kinds of couplings, there's, we're using transition metals, which honestly is a little bit more difficult, which is a little bit more difficult than, um, well, it's not more difficult, it just requires a different kind of reagent than what we're used to. We're just not used to using transition metals but most organic synthesis now is done with these transition metals. It's something that we don't necessarily get into in the first two organic classes. But if there was to be a third, that's what we would spend a lot of time on. If there would be a third, it would be optional. It would not be required. Josh? The transition metals that are used relatively expensive, or is it just like no, the, like palladium and platinum are super expensive, but yeah, and I didn't, and I didn't say this explicitly. So, when you were to do this, when you did this reaction, number one, I would not put chunks of palladium into the reaction because it's too expensive. It's so what would happen is that we would take the palladium metal and we would coat it onto the surface of something cheap, like carbon pellets. And so when you actually in this reaction, what you're going to see is you're going to see PD parentheses C. And that's palladium metal coated on a surface of carbon. Because in these reactions, what's important is the surface, not the bulk of the metal. So what we want to do is coat something cheap with palladium metal, and then the reaction occurs at the surface. But let's say we had palladium beads. What we would do at the end of the reaction sure. is we would filter those out and use them again and use them as many times as possible. Um, and so the, they're, they're not cheap, they're expensive, but usually they're reusable up to a certain point. They can, they can get poisoned. The surface can get poisoned. Well, remember the Lindler catalyst was what we call the poisoned catalyst. It had stuff attached to the surface that only allowed a triple bond to be reduced to a double bond that stopped there. So the technical term for these catalysts is they become poisoned. So that's something that comes into play as well. Because if we're going to do these in water, just filter out the reagent, set it aside. The water isn't going to be significantly contaminated, so we could either reuse it again, or it's water, so it's not going to be too to environment. It's not like we got a ton of hexane to get rid of. So that's that's where these kinds of organometallic reagents come into play. So there's heck coupling, there's Suzuki coupling, and those are our and those are the big two couplings that I believe are are in top hat. Okay. Now, we're still not done with adding stuff to benzene. What we really need to do is we need to talk more about some making and adding some additional groups to the benzene ring. So let's start with <coughs> phenol. And I'm going to work into aniline. So if we have phenol and aniline, particularly with phenol, there's two things I'd like to be able to do with phenol. I would like to be able to convert a phenol into 
and Esther. Because some of the problems that you're turning in had esters attached to the benzene ring and I may want to talk or you may want to ask a question about whether this group is activating, deactivating, whether it's orthopara or meta director. But hold that question for a minute because I have still nine minutes until we get to ten, ten minutes left. How do I do that? I don't have to tell you. No ideas at all? No, that's exactly what you need to do is make water leave. But what are you going to add to it? Because I don't see any water right at the moment. Nope. No, because the water can't leave because this is a benzene ring. And we have never put a positive charge on a double bond. Period. So what am I going to add to the alcohol to make the ester? Take the uh, an ACL three plus no 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 four. You might be able to do that. You might be able to convert this to an O minus, but then what am I going to react it with? No. You're getting closer, though. You do need to add a carbonyl group. No. Hold on. <laughs> That's all you need. That's it. If you react to carboxylic acid chloride with an alcohol, you'll make an ester. <coughs> oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> all right, so if you want to make an ester, react an alcohol with a carboxylic acid chloride. Where did the carboxylic acid chloride come from? Something plus SOCl2. No, but you're close. Carboxylic acid. So why don't I just do this then? React the carboxylic acid with the alcohol to make the ester. Well, I need a reagent to make this happen. I need one more reagent. Exactly. 
So you can use an acid chloride or you can use a carboxylic acid in H+. Now I don't usually ask questions that I don't think you know the answers to. Nobody's had a deja vu moment yet? <laughs> Who was in lab yesterday? Who was in lab Tuesday? Almost everybody in was in lab this week. Almost everybody. Those that are not part of this discussion. What did you do in lab this week? You made benzocaine, and how did you do that? You refluxed it for an hour, yes? No, well, yes, primary alcohol, I'll give you. You took this molecule and you added to it ethanol. H plus. And what did you make? The ethyl ester. When you react an alcohol and a carboxylic acid with an acid catalyst, that's what kind of sterification? It has a name associated with it. It's Fisher. It's Fisher esterification. I'll just answer that five hundred. It's Fisher esterification. So you did this in lab yesterday or this week, sometime. In lab like three months ago. It was only it was only four weeks ago, but it may seem longer. You got a bottle that had a carboxylic acid and an alcohol in it. You poured that bottle into a round bottom. What did you add to it? Sulfuric acid. What did you do? Refluxed it. What did you make? An unknown. (laughs) An unknown what? An unknown ester. What are you going to do next week? You're going to distill that ester and then we're going to figure out what it is. So I've just, you know, done the impossible, which is, or I guess what I'm not supposed to do, which is break down the wall between organic lab and organic lecture. A wall that shouldn't be there to begin with. The only wall that's there is time. If you took it six months ago, or nine months ago, I could see forgetting about it. But if it was just 24 to 48 hours, we should at least keep that close. So this is what we did. We did a Fisher esterification. So you want to make an acid, you want to make an ester, use the acid chloride, Use the carboxylic acid. How do you get the acid chloride by reacting the SOCl2 with um, the carboxylic acid? Now, for doing the aniline, I we actually did this in lab as well. We converted the NH2 to a C double bond O with the N on it, to sort of protect that from the KMnO4. Now, what we did was we reacted that with acetic anhydride which I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go through and torture you by trying to make you remember that because that's not probably going to be that successful, but that's what we did. But I would just say if you want to convert the NH2 to the amide, the easiest way right now to do that is to react this with the acid chloride. Is there a way to do it with the carboxylic acid? Yes, 
but it doesn't react. Carboxylic acid doesn't react with an amine the same way as it reacts with an alcohol, and we'll get to that. Okay, so that's how we can convert the N's and O's to the amides and the esters. And then where I left them this morning, and trust me, everybody had the same problem remembering what we did in lab yesterday. I said, over the weekend, why don't you think about this when you have free time? The last thing, the last oxygen species I need to be able to make off the ring is an ether. So how would I make, how would I convert the alcohol, in this case the phenol, to an ether? Oh, I know. It's okay. All right, so think about that. I could give you a hint, but I won't. All right. Um, so we're going to finish. We'll talk about reactions of phenols on Monday, and then we will finish up with nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Not electrophilic aromatic substitution, but nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And we'll, we'll make up some time in the carbonyl, because after the exam we'll be talking about carbonyl chemistry. All right, do you have any questions on the homework problems, Sarah? Can I do O? I can do them all, so ask me whether I will do them or not. I forgot magnesium in this. <laughs> so I forgot I forgot to put magnesium. So when you add the Br2 FeBr3, you get the bromine added onto the ring. When you add the magnesium, you're going to add magnesium and make the Grignard out of it. When you add CO2 to that, you're going to go ahead and convert that to a carboxylic acid. And then when you add the ethyl chloride with the aluminum trichloride, that you're going to add an ethyls, you're going to add an ethyl group to the ring. The carboxylic acid is what? Ortho para or meta director. It's a meta director, so the ethyl group would end up meta to that. So I have that one I forgot the magnesium. T. Okay, what happens when you have groups on the ring that are equal? So this is T. So if I add HNO3, H2SO4 to a methyl, to orthomethyl ethyl benzene, um, since these are the same groups, the question really is, do they direct to the same positions? If they, the two groups direct to the same position, that's where you're going to add. If they direct to opposite positions, then you're going to get all the products. So the methyl group is going to direct here, here. The ethyl group is going to direct here and here. So I'm actually going to get a nitro group at each one of those positions. So there's going to be four products with a nitro group at each one of those positions. So when the groups are equal and they point in opposite directions, you get it's like a 50-50 mixture of each product. No. So when we've talked about the stabilities of carbocations, or when we've talked about the most substituted double bond, we've never made a distinction between methyl, ethyl, or a 100 carbon chain. 
right? It doesn't matter what the group is. So there may be a steric issue, but we're disregarding sterics. And if you want to make a steric argument, then you'll have to write sterics on your answer so that I know that's the argument you're making. I'll take it under advisement whether it's correct or not and whether I wish to accept it. Wait, so how do you do S? So how do you do S? I don't know, let's see. So S has a methyl group, and it's got an ethyl group here, and what am I adding? Another nitro group? So if I'm adding my NO2+, plus, the methyl group is going to direct here and here. The ethyl group is also directing there and there. And we never add in between meta positions. So in this case, they're directing, those two equal groups are directing in the same, to the same position. And so if they direct to the same position, we would just get a nitro group there and we would get a nitro group and therefore R as well will have four different products no we'll just have two different products because the methyl and the ethyl are pointing to the same two positions oh, right so we're just we're just going to get um, those two products All right, since we're asking questions, I'll ask the final question then. I still got three minutes. My watch, my time. Uh, this is problem E. Which, this is E. So you're adding a CH3 plus. Which ring are you adding to? The one. The one on the left or the one on the right? Left. Because the bromine is deactivated. I don't even have to. I don't even have to answer the question. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Josh. No, I know. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Why do you have to add the left? <laughs> yeah, well, so the BR is a deactivating group, therefore the right ring is having electrons removed from it. The other one is having electron or electron density supplied to it, therefore it has the highest ability to accept the electron. Thank you. That's correct. <laughs> Did everybody understand the reasoning? the reasoning for that? I can state it in a slightly different way. Not, your answer was great. Um, so whenever you have two rings, the electrophile is going to add to the ring that is most electron rich. Those two rings actually add electron density to each other. So that's a wash. What happens is, is that the right hand ring is having some electron density pulled out by the bromine and the left hand ring I would say is not. So which of these two rings is more electron rich? It's the one on the left and so that's w where the electrophile is going to add. This, that ring then, this ring is now a substituent so it's directing ortho and para so that your electrophile, why does it want to keep doing this? Your groups would then add ortho para. I will post I will post the answer key for this. There is a narrated answer key as well. I'll post the um, answer key for this later this afternoon 
so you can take a look at it. If you have any questions, email me. Come see me on Monday. Uh, Monday we're gonna we'll finish up this we'll finish up these topics and then on Wednesday again we'll have a review for the exam. <laughs> what? Yes, there's a homework assignment due Monday. It's in Wednesday's folder. Um, would you be able to sign progress report for this fall? Oh, well, sure. Do you think you're making good progress? I think it's this stack. Just one stack. Do you want to put your grade down? Yeah. It's at the bottom. And then the lab. Let's see. Absences only for games. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it.